This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor, and I'm joined by my co host, my bros of Joshua Ryan Rusin, community director at Jake and Gino. Josh, how are you doing today? Gino, doing well, man. Excited that uh, I guess I can officially let the cat out of the bag, moving uh, us and some of the team down to St. Augustine in, in January. So we're excited to be close to you and the family. Uh, Gino, what are you excited about today? That means one thing, Josh. That means my food bill's going up even more, bro. I got six kids. I'm going to have maybe eight or nine now. So it's all good, right, my friend? It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, weather's down here is great. Opening up phase two, whatever that means, things are rock and rolling down here. Thank God. I live in Florida and not New York. That's all I got to say. So this is going to be an interesting podcast because our guest is originally from New York like myself. So Josh, let's jump into this one, bro. Yeah, so today's guest is Marshall Friedman. So he's currently a full-time multifamily investor. Uh, he's been invested in real estate for over five years. Prior to being a full-time real estate investor, Marshall was an investment banker where he executed sell-side and capital raise mandates for clients. His responsibilities included all aspects of the deal process, such as financial modeling, performing due diligence, creating marketing materials, and coordinating deal execution. Without further ado, welcome to the show, Marshall. Hey guys, thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Of course. All right, Marshall, so let's talk a little bit about you. How, how you got into being a, a banker, why you got into it, and then when we started getting into real estate. Uh, let's, let's dive into everything. Yeah, so I've got to step just a, uh, maybe take one or two step backs here, steps back here. It basically started off when I was in China. I lived in China for five years. I spent four years at Alibaba there. And I basically... Throughout the experience, it was fantastic. It was very unique. What I, what I really realized while I was there was that the most valuable thing that I had learned there was my ability to speak Chinese. And I wanted to move in a trajectory that gave me more sort of these hard skill sets that I could apply to, to, to life and, and work later on. So I went to business school. I focused on finance. I moved into investment banking because I saw that as the most technical of all the career paths that, that sort of led out of, of the MBA program that I was in. And so I spent, I spent two and a half years in New York, just really grinding it out, long hours, waking up at 9.30, getting the office around 10, but then staying until 12, 1, 2, later on in the morning. So I, at some point, it basically occurred. I mean, I, I knew I never wanted to do that forever it, with the hours and the lifestyle in New York. It just wasn't sustainable, but it was, it was something very interesting, and it was an experience that I really wanted to have. So while I was there, I started listening to podcasts. I I found my way to Jake and Gino's podcast and I started listening more and more about multifamily real estate. And I said, you know what, everything that I've learned here in investment banking can be applied to real estate and I can basically create something on my own here. So from there, I basically, I picked up, I, I went on a long road trip all throughout the Southeast. Uh, I met with you, Josh, down in, in Knoxville and we sort of had a talk about where a best place might, go, might be to go to live to pursue this full time. So what you showed me was of all the places I had on this map that I had basically built was that Knoxville was right in the middle of all of these different hotspots that I had. And so that to me became a no brainer. Also at the same time, it's a, a very low cost of living relatively. So it, was, it allowed me to really pursue this full time and to, to really just jump in with both feet. So Josh and Marshall, it's amazing how all of our students have a different trajectory or a different path to get into multifamily. Some of them dip their toes in the water. Some of them are working hard. Some of them are mechanics. Some of them like Marshall are investment bankers who speak Mandarin. But I think Marshall, a couple of things that stand out for me with Jake and Gino students is number one, they need to work really, really hard. And all of our students work really hard. And number two, they need to have clarity. And I think after a while, the daily grinds living in the city, not having that freedom and, and having that clarity. What brought that clarity? What made you want to get into multifamily? It was, it was a number of things. I mean, there's, there's one, there's, there's of course the long-term dream of being a passive investor or just investing in something passively and learning it, but that's, that's down the road. And so the, I sort of saw that as the future. I saw also the way to get there is building equity. Of course, now to get there, it, it's, to me, it's a grind, but I, I love the grind. So, so for me, it's, it's jumping in with the skill sets I've learned from investment banking. It's using the modeling. It's using the, 
uh, driving deals and sort of that deal mindset to look for deals and to, and to run them and run the execution. And I saw that as just creating a better lifestyle for me long-term. New York, working these crazy hours, living in a 650 square foot apartment with my wife, I knew down the road wasn't going to cut it, especially if we we're thinking about a family in the future, which is something that we are. So I just saw that that equation didn't really work. And I saw multifamily as a way to, to really jump at it and, and, and create a good future for myself. So Marshall, you put in all this time at your job, an investment banker, right? You went to schooling. I'm sure you're climbing the ranks and there's even more upward mobility. What were your thoughts when you're thinking, all right, I'm going to burn the boats, go on to multifamily? Because that's not an easy leap to make. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think there was one one day in particular that really hit me. I, I remember I was speaking with one of my VPs who was a level above me. It would have probably taken me another two years to get there. And I was I was on that trajectory. And and I, I, I was speaking with him and he had just had a baby and I was kind of joking with him and I was like, great, so you, you can't wait to send your kid to private school, huh? And he just goes, yeah, right. And I was like, yeah, right. You're, 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 you're a vice president in an in international global investment bank in New York. If you can't send your kids to private school, then, then who can? And I and, and in New York, it just uh, it's just that expensive. And so I was thinking that that really sort of made me think, and I, I started thinking long term about kids and families, and that if I was going to do that, New York was probably even in investment banking was not going to be the best scenario for me personally. And I I thought about the way that I grew up. I grew up in a, a house with a yard, and and, and I, I was able to bike around my neighborhood and just sort of thinking about that trajectory for, for living in New York just really stops making sense. You know, Marshall, so I'm sure a lot of listeners are in a similar position, right? They have a high income, they have upward mobility, and those golden handcuffs are starting to get tighter and tighter. And they know this, right? They know what they're doing isn't going to get them where they want and the lifestyle they desire. What advice would you give to those that are on the cusp or on the fence of going all in in real estate or at least making it more of a priority and pursuing it? I'd say it's a few things. I'd say, first of all, make sure, make sure you're passionate about it. What you don't want to do is you don't want to jump off a cliff and, and then say halfway through, you know what, I don't really want to do this. Make sure it's, it's a binary. You're either you're in or you're out and you're going to be in if you're passionate about it. For me, there's a lot of things I like about real estate. I love the fact that it's tangible. I love the fact that it, it ties so, so closely with my own investing mindset. And it, it just, it, every time I, even, even here now, every time I, maybe I get nervous about something, I sort of think in a big circle. I say, well, if I couldn't be doing this, what else would I be doing? And I always come back full circle and I think, you know what? I'm exactly where I need to be. The, the second thing that people need to consider as well is they need to plan carefully for it. So what I don't recommend for anyone to do is just to say, you know what? I'm just going to jump into this thing with, without thinking about it financially or my future. Do you know, you talk about it all the time. It's important to sort of be able to say, you know, I can, I can set aside an amount of money or, or whatever you have, lifestyle or whatever, to, to really pursue this. You want to be careful with your planning and you want to, you want to also be, able, be, be somewhat confident that if you need to go back to doing whatever you're doing, you can't. So, so for me, that's, that's probably my best advice. So Josh and, and Marshall, I took a few notes on what you said that's really important. And I need to really get this out because it's important. First of all, we have limiting beliefs. If we're stuck in a 650 square foot New York City apartment working 70 hours a week, is it going to be hard or easy to do multifamily when everyone around you thinks you're crazy for doing it, right? So one of the things that Marshall did is he says, let me join a community of like-minded individuals who are taking this leap and let me join them. Now, I don't recommend everybody, you know, leaving their, their, where they live and going like Marshall did initially in the beginning, but Marshall cut the rope and he had some more financial means. If you need to do that, do that. I did that moving from New York down to Florida. I did the same exact thing Marshall did. I wanted to be my, be in my backyard. Don't think too long because if you think too long and you think too hard, you have analysis paralysis, write down the pros, write down the cons and speak to a coach, a life coach, business coach. Don't talk to your family about it because they're going to think you're crazy. Because my next question is, I'm going to ask Marshall what people thought, but it's very important. I'm reading the book Limitless by Jim Quick. Josh, thanks for that book. It really talks about your state. And when you're learning, if you have that limiting belief of you can't do it, or you're, you're there and you don't have a positive state or a positive frame of mind, you're not going to be able to do it. How hard is it when you're disconnected and you're not in it. That's really important. So take all of that and really digest that. What did people say to you, Marshall, when you're like, I'm leaving New York, I'm going down to Tennessee? Well, here's, here's, here's kind of the, here's the craziest part, because to me, like this whole, this whole notion of, of quitting my, my, my high paying job in New York, 
to, to pursuing something like this, I thought I was crazy. And I, 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 I told people all the time, I was like, you know, I think I might be a little bit crazy, but I really, really want to do this. I was, I was really excited about it. The craziest part of this whole, whole journey so far, actually, to me, was the amount of support that I had. I remember just knocking on, on, on the group co-head's door. I had, to, I had to go talk to him to let him know that I was leaving the company. And that was certainly one of the most scary things I've ever done in my life. And I sat there and he just says, you know what? That sounds really awesome. I know so-and-so who does this. Let me know if you need help while you're, while you're pursuing this. And, and the crazy thing for me, too, is that talking to my, even, even talking to my family after I sort of decided I was doing this, people said, you know what? If you're really passionate about it, just do it. Just do it. You can go back to doing whatever you want later. You, you seem to have thought this through. You, you've joined a mentor program. You've been doing the reading. You've been talking about this for a long time now. It's just the, the level and, and telling my friends too, just the, the amount of belief that people had in me was shocking. I, I really thought that more people was, were going to tell me that I was crazy, but not almost no one has. And, 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 and what's even crazier is oftentimes when I'm talking to people about it and I, and I, and I, sh I share with them what I've learned about, IRR and cash on cash returns and, and everything like that, people, people start saying instead of, wow, you're crazy, people are starting to say, mm -hmm. how can I invest with you? Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell me, tell, show me the deals that you, you're seeing? I'm, I'm really curious and I'm interested. You, and, and it's just, um, that, that to me was just, when, when someone, instead of, say, instead of saying, you're crazy, is, is how can I invest is just, uh, it's, it's mind blowing. It's so not what I expected at all. There's a lot of different steps in that. So jo Josh and I like to say a lot of times proper planning prevents piss poor performance. So you don't just get up one day and go, I'm leaving, right? You really have to think it through. You really have to put the hard work and the effort into it. I had a different experience than you did. When I told everyone I was leaving New York, I mean, grandparents, grandmas, everyone's like, you're crazy. What are you doing? You've got a nice house here. You've got a nice lifestyle. And I'm thinking, okay, I've got six kids and, and I don't want to hear anybody out there saying, well, Gino can do it. Marshall can do it, but I can't. That's a bunch of crap. Cause I had six kids. I had a nice comfortable lifestyle up there. I could have probably bought a second home down here, but I wanted a transformation. I wanted to change. I wanted to step out of my comfort zone. And that's what exactly what Marshall did going from a high paying job, living in a nice city to living in Tennessee, which is a complete transformation, completely out of his comfort zone. And the most important thing that Marshall said in that whole segue was if it doesn't work out, he can always go back. I think Marshall is more afraid of living in regret of not trying it right now than when he starts having a family because then the family is going to be the excuse. Although that should never be an excuse because that's just another excuse. I could have said, I'm not going anywhere. I have six kids. That would have been my excuse. So that's just an excuse, ultimately taking responsibility. But everyone, listen to what he said. He said, I can always go back if it doesn't work out. But I'd rather have you try for 12 months or 18 months, get your reticulated activating system working where you're focusing on what you want to focus on and whatever you focus on grows. And three to six months of podcasts and learning and education and walking on properties and property tours and putting LOIs in, all of a sudden that education is going to expand and you're going to become more comfortable. And then all of a sudden you start talking to other people and what Marshall said, hey, never heard of that before. Can I invest? That all starts to grow. And 12 months later, everyone's like, well, Marshall, you're lucky you left the city. What's going on now? So it's not luck, everybody. Proper planning. How has your life changed since you left? I mean, give us some of that right now before we go into the deals and before what you learn. Like what has really changed? So if somebody's on the cusp right now, they have that living belief, I'm stuck here. I can't get out. What do I do next? What has changed in your life? You're like, well, this is awesome. Yeah. So, so first of all, I mean, most importantly, I, I could, the, the support of my wife was huge for all of this. And, mm -hmm. and so she, it, it was sort of, it was, it was almost bad coming home at night when I was in New York. And sometimes she'd just say, you know what, Marshall, I miss you because I'd be coming home too late. And so sometimes there'd be several days on end where we wouldn't see each other. And so I, I do a lot of it for her. So one thing that's changed for sure is I, I, I work hard. I spend a lot of time at this real estate stuff and I, I really enjoy it. But at the same time, if I want to just stop and hang out with my wife for a little while or spend time with her. If she wants to go to dinner, if we want to drive to the mountains, you can do what's, what's, what's exciting about this is that you can spend a lot of time on the road or, or doing whatever you want to do. And you can focus on real estate uh, in, in other places. You're not, you're not tied to a desk. You're not tied to a chair. You're not tied to an office. I also really like the fact that it allows me just to get out and meet people. So for me, I knew that the network was going to be the most important thing for me here because that's what was going to, keep me propped up while I'm, while I'm just jumping off of a cliff and chasing something like this. So attending every single meetup I can, calling people up, taking people to coffee, meeting people for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or anything to, 
to, to do that. So just being on the road way more, which is something that I love. Uh, and I, I love about, I love about this has been fantastic and I can bring my wife with me and she can participate as much as she wants. I love it. So Marshall, what are some of the skill sets that you think every multifamily investor needs? You, let's talk about some of the skill sets that you have, but also some of the other skill sets that you learned because you're throwing in networking in there and, and going into meetups and all that. So what are some of the skill sets that you brought from your previous uh, job into multifamily what, and expand on that? So, so first and foremost, business, anything business related to me is, is really just code for it's all about people. Mm-hmm. And so being very good with people, networking a lot. I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's important in investment banking, it's important in real estate, it's important in everything. So ha- building a network, making friends, being very social, you want to be, you, you want to be able to, to partner up with, with anyone you meet and, and, and you want other people to say, you know what, I like this person, I want to partner with them too. So, so just being social and being, putting yourself out there, I think is rule number one. Uh, doing this on your own is, is not something that I would recommend to anyone ever. Um, doing anything on your own is something I would never recommend to anyone. Mm-hmm. Right? I love people. I love teams. So that's so from a sort of the softer side, it's it's that. From more of a, a harder skills perspective, to me, working in Excel and learning about models, learning about finance has has been really really helped for me. It's how I've been able to join teams and add value immediately. I'm able to go in and, and look at a model and and to really just dive in with with the skill sets that I've developed from both school and, and from uh, the investment banking job. And then also it's, it's just being in something else I've learned probably more from investment banking than anything else is, is learning to stay organized. So you want, as, as you guys say all the time, it's really important to do what you say. And so to, to me, to do that, rule number one is be organized. If you say something, write it down immediately, put it in your calendar, stay on top of every single piece of, of information that comes in and goes out. And, and as a result, one, you become way more trustworthy because you follow through with everything. You're not going to forget anything if you're if you're on top of everything like that. But it, at the same time, it also really helps with with deal execution. And 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 that was another sort of area where I was able to be very helpful in in a deal that we closed recently. Just following up with everyone, making sure everyone was staying on on task with everything, and um and and really just pushing forward the execution. I love that. So let me let me I guess rephrase that. Or let me just package that for everybody real quick. How do you be more social? Number one, it's all about education. It's all about getting comfortable and being able to talk about what an IRR is, what a cash on cash return is, why you're buying in Nashville, Tennessee. You need that education. Um, if you're an introvert and you don't know how to speak about multifamily, but you go to a meetup, you're going to feel really uncomfortable. So learn that education. Number two is uh, adding value, really, really adding the value to somebody else. Like Marshall said, he's, he's in the deal execution. He can financial model. So if you have somebody out there who's a real great networker, but doesn't know how to financial model or underwrite, maybe both of you, of you partner up. That's really important. I think number three, which we always stress on the show every week because we have the students, is join a community any community it is out there. We'd love you for you to join the Jake and Gino community, but join one that's really focused on, if you want to flip homes, find somebody who's flipping homes. If you want to wholesale, find someone who's doing a wholesale. I love multifamily real estate. Join a community that you think that, you know, is going to resonate with you from the level that you want to and really go out there and I start identifying with it and start getting out there and start meeting people. So I don't want to hear this excuse anymore that you're not a, uh, you're, you're everyone out there is not a networker because I was not. Josh can go out there and he can speak to a tree and he'd love it. Me, I'd want to be inside for most of the time, but you need to step out of your comfort zone. And how do you do that is you become more proficient at, at, at the skill and it'll become easier and you don't need to go to a networking event and speak to 20 people go there by yourself go to speak to one or two people and make that impactful and really have a set of expectations and like marshall said i follow through i'm constantly taking notes because i have to write stuff down because i forget and you have to be organized right yes it's right next to him because that's how you go throughout the day you're you know you're you're have your you live in the conscious your subconscious mind is constantly working whatever's conscious whatever you put down on paper you start working on so that is really important josh you want to uh Ask Marshall about the deal itself and how he got the deal and, and you know how it's looking right now. Yeah, Marshall, let's jump into it. a little bit about where the deal is, how you guys found it, how many units, what the opportunity is, and, and a little bit of the process going through it. Yes, the process would be great, yeah. Marshall. I think that's what, probably most important. It's your first deal. Is it overwhelming? I mean, uh, was it exciting? I mean, what did you do? Like, walk us through that whole process. Yeah, uh, yeah. So gladly. I mean, it's so. First of all, just to say, I mean, it's it's really 
do, doing a deal in real estate is not that dissimilar from doing a deal in, in investment banking. It's, there are going to be parts that are stressful. It is gonna, there are parts that are going to be a grind, especially as you're getting into the diligence and the financing stages. But it's, it, it's, all, it's all thrilling, and, and it's just I, – I love it. So this deal is uh, – that we recently closed. I think we closed it on March – I think it was 17th. It was sometime mid-March. It was after coronavirus had started. It was, it was basically uh, – it, 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 it had starting to become a little bit of an issue, but we were able to kind of push through it. We were very fortunate with our lenders. Um, so this is a 49-unit deal in Johnson City, Tennessee. Mm. It is a 1980s slash 1990s build. Some of it was built in the 80s. Some of it was built in the 90s. It's a classic. So this is something that that I look for. It's a classic mismanaged property, I would mm -hmm. say. Not not necessarily mom and pop, but they're out-of-state investors who have really not paid close enough attention to how the property is being operated. So that that is really more about capex issues and it's also about targeting the uh, the right clientele to come in mm -hmm. this particular property is located close to a hospital so there, there's a there's, there's a, a nice large um business there that that is a relatively safe place for jobs and, and you have relatively high high um high net worth, not high net worths but people earning decent salaries so what, mm -hmm. what we can do we realize is we can reposition this this particular property to target a slightly more affluent crowd or you can move it up a little bit but at the same time it's there, there's deferred maintenance all over the place you, you can go if you, could the curb appeal when we first got this place i'm telling you was uh was lacking to say the least mm -hmm. so we saw a great opportunity to come in fix it up the interiors as well we we see the typical kind of redoing the paint re upgrading the bathrooms upgrading the appliances the a, a lot of this stuff has just sort of been left to to just hang on to and it, it, it doesn't look very good and it, you're not going to command the best prices you can and at the same time if you run it more efficient, efficiently you, you put in more into the capex you can make it run more efficiently from the opex side as well so so from both ends we're kind of attacking it and, and so far it's it's been great I, I it worries me because multifamily in general so far has been doing pretty good throughout all of this we've collected 90 90 percent of our rents for the for, for this month and that was actually within like the first five or six days so i think now we're, we're even higher and we did the same for, for the previous month as well so we're, we're we're being a little bit more conservative with our with our cash because we want to just hold on to it we're, we're not pursuing some of the larger capex um initiatives just yet we we kind of want to see how things play out and make sure that things remain comfortable but we are starting to realize that we can be spending a little bit more on the capex to, to push things forward on this particular property so anything that in there they're in the process that you said i should have done this differently like anything that stands out because like on our first deal jake and i on our very first deal we did same thing when we offered a price we should have we said to ourselves we could have probably offered a lower price uh we should have retraded and got some more capex done before closing because there was definitely some issues that we should have we didn't test the septic fields because it was in the winter time we should have put some money in escrow for the septic fields uh, the tenant base was terrible. We should have gotten some pricing off of the tenant base. There were a lot of things that we probably overlooked or didn't know because we were really anxious to get our first deal done and I didn't want it to stop us. Do you think anything, I don't want to say glaring, but like, wow, if you go back six weeks or eight weeks, I said, we should have done that. Yeah. So, so for me, I think the, the type of financing that we pursued, we probably mm -hmm. could have done something else. So we went, we went agency on this one. We worked with, we worked with Fannie and also we were working in a way that with with the deal with the PSA itself, we we didn't have a financing contingency, which I think at the time was pretty normal. But yes. even still, it put a lot of pressure on us to get it done quickly. I don't think we were able to explore financing as much as we could or should have, and so the the financing process was just uh, particularly uh, I don't know what the right complicated. I would challenging. Say. We're challenging yes that's a that's a great one it's uh it, it's just that we were really up against deadlines all the time and there were our own deadlines earnest money was getting having to get put down so it just increases the stress levels so and and, and we and, and it, we ended up getting the financing on, on great terms which is good but i think if we could have done it again we we could have either sort of paralleled pro that process a little bit better with with local debt um in case we wanted to switch over for that so and and i just don't know that going out of the gates with agency is, is the easiest or best way to do it, but we, we got it done. So, so we're, we're happy with that. And again, we got a great, we got a great rate partly due to the timing of, of the virus and everything like that. So that was good. It was before all of this, um, before we had to put down all of this sort of money for the, for the, um, 
reserves. For the financing, which is great mm-hmm. as well. The reserves, yep. thank you, yeah. So let me so let me let me reframe or rephrase this. What what Marshall saw in this deal for everybody, the value add components of this deal, the curb appeal was lacking. So they went out and they fixed the interiors of the units and the exteriors of the units, the tenant base. So Marshall saw the value add in the tenant base because if you can get tenants who are paying, you know, where the median income is a little bit higher, you're next to a place where the jobs pay a little bit more. You can raise those rents. Raising those rents raises the net operating income of the property. It's definitely a mom and pop in the perspective that they are out of state. They probably were, I don't want to say motivated, but they sold it and they weren't managing it properly. Uh, The other thing I think here, I think he's right about the debt. Looking back at it now, it's easy to say we should have gone community. I guess I would recommend everybody out there when a deal like this, take it to both. See what the community bank can do for you and see what the agency can do for you. And we refine roll our deals. So we liked when we first started out, we went with community. Now community has some negatives. It's recourse debt. So you're personally guaranteeing it. But if you can get a community and we use community banks, Marshall, almost like a bridge loan where we get a 25 year and we get very low prepayment penalties, if none. So after a year, they now community banks were even offering a year or 18 months of interest only. So we're really, you know, using that to reposition the property. So if you have 49 units and you need to do four or five units, you know, a month within 18 months, you can have most of the property repositioned. And then after 18 months, you can go into agency financing. That's what we've been doing for, for the longest time. So uh, it's exciting. You going back at all that now, Marshall's got the plan to go on to his next deal, the framework for his next deal. Where What's your uh, goal or game plan for the rest of the year for this property? Yeah, so I mean, right now it's just, it's it's the to, it's just a little bit of a wait and see. But since we've been so successful at collecting so far, we're, we're going to start we're going to start plowing in a little bit more capex to to really just execute the business plan like we talked about. So just just making these units a little bit nicer, going after more market unit rents. I mean, one of the good things about working with agency is they they really they will dig into the numbers and they dig into every detail as well. And they verified the fact mm-hmm. that they verified our, our business plan and the fact that this, this property is under operating and that, that we can, we can find other ways for upside and, and to lower the expenses. So it's to stick up, fix up the CapEx and, and, and improve the property in general. I love that. Let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsors. Is your money working as hard as you are? At Ram Partners, we partner with hardworking investors who are seeking true passive income through multifamily real estate. Partnering with RAN means transparent communication with our webinars, monthly statements, and newsletters. For more information, visit rampartners.com to register for our investor portal and to set up a call with our team. All right, so Marshall, let's talk about this. You know, if you could go back to a year ago, right? You're thinking of making this transition. Give us a, a framework or advice for those that are on the outside looking in, wanting to do what you're doing now. What, what kind of advice would you give them? Yeah, so, so first and foremost, I would say learn about the asset class, learn about where you want to invest, and make sure it's something that you personally are passionate about. I think the next step from that is, is start reading and learning and listening to podcasts to get as much information as you can. And finally, what you want to do is you want to find a community or a mentor who's going to help you. So for me, that was Jake and Gino. I had found these guys through Bigger Pockets, and I'd done a bunch of research, compared them to other groups, and I found that this one in particular for me worked out perfectly. Now I have a mentor. I have a huge group of, of people who are, who are there for me if I need help. And I think that that's, that's the best way to do it. Love it. Marshall, what about your favorite book you've ever read and why? So I've got a, I've got a few. I have, to, I, have to go, I have to start with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Not to be cliche, but I read that in high school. And that was the book that sort of put me off in this whole, quote unquote, business trajectory. I'd say from... From, from there, Delivering Happiness was probably my favorite book. And that's by Tony Hsieh. That's, uh, that's the guy who started Zappos. Zappos. And, and the reason why I love that book, yep, if you, if you can remember that. <laughs> Bought by Amazon. And uh, the, the reason why it's so good, though, is just because it, it, it really puts the focus on people. And I think that that's the most important aspect of, of business is, is the focus on people. And then most recently, I read a great book. Uh, it was called The Most Important Thing by Howard Marks. And that's a book about risk and investing. And I think that it's highly applicable to, to multifamily real estate or anything else. And so I think it's, I think it's fantastic. Awesome. I love that. What about your best habit for success? So for me, it's, 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 it's certainly mindset. And that for me starts with working out in the morning. I, when I, when I wake up, the first thing, the first thing I do is, is exercise. I feel much more happy and positive about the day. And it also, 
it feels like I've gotten the most difficult part of the day out of the way already when you're finished. And so for me, that it just puts me in a good mood and it, it gets me ready to go. Like it. All right. So there've been a lot of golden nuggets in this episode, a lot of good takeaways. Uh, three of them that really stood out to me is one, it, it's really all about your network. That's huge. And having that like-minded community uh, Two, Marshall meant or mentioned falling in love with the grind, right? Your actions and, and the business you're doing. Um, and then lastly, there, there's a quote, I'm going to butcher it here. It's an idiot with a plan can be a genius without one, right? So having that team and having that framework on how to build this business. Uh, Gina, what do you have to add to that? I took a lot of notes here, Josh. Let me go through that framework again for everybody. The first one Marshall said, and I agree, is pick an asset class. I will expand on that a little more. And I think Marshall did it intuitively. Pick the market. I mean, really choose one or two markets where you really want to invest in. And Marshall just picked up and he moved to it. You don't have to move to it, but... Uh, you have to choose a market. What you focus on grows. The second thing is you have to have some type of passion towards it. Because if you have passion towards something or you enjoy it, when you start studying it, you start learning it, you're going to enjoy it and you're going to remember it more. You know, your physiology and your state really affect your learning ability. So if you're going to enjoy something, that's really important. The third thing is education times action equals results. The education is the important component into it, but also taking that action like Marshall did. The fourth thing is uh, the community. I think the community is very important. Getting, in, getting involved with other people and just surrounding yourself with like-minded people, going to all these different events is so important because it's going to raise your level of energy. You're pumped. I mean, after I'm off this podcast today, my day is set. Marshall worked out this morning. I'm on the podcast. So my day is set. I'm, I'm excited. I love talking about real estate and I'm learning. So that's the thing. You're learning, you're doing, you're teaching. So when you're learning something, you're doing it, right? Marshall did it. Now he's actually on this show teaching others and he's learning it even more, which is really exciting. I think the last thing, Josh, is to think differently. Uh, if you're not doing something where people say you're crazy, then you're not doing something right. And I can give you an example of my life. We homeschool our kids. Most people thought I was crazy for the last 20 years. Well, guess what? everyone's homeschooling now because they have to. And it's a normal thing, right? <laughs> Years ago, everyone thought it was crazy. Uh, also, just think about it. You, if you're thinking about leaving like Marshall, that everyone thinks you're crazy. Well, guess what? There's a lot of people leaving New York now. They thought I was crazy three years ago. Now they don't think you have to do what's right for you. You have to feel it in your bones. You have to feel like it's, it's great. There is no such thing as the box. There's the box. Think outside the box. That's why the rich dad, poor dad really resonates with people because it pushes the envelope of, you know what? An asset really is your house really is an asset but intuitively it's not an asset and that's what pisses people off in the financial world because they're like oh it really is but an asset simply is money something that puts money in your pocket and a house doesn't do that and people get really crazy about that so think outside the box think differently and think about pushing yourself and think about getting uncomfortable and you will be rewarded in the long term and if nothing else you can always go back to the way things were. But I guarantee you, when you hit a goal, Josh, that, the, the goal is not what you want to do. It's the journey of the person you become when you finally hit that goal. That's what we're striving for. We're not striving for 100 units. We're striving to become the person that needs to get to the 100 units. Then when you get to the 100 units, you want to go to 1,000 units. You're not striving for 1,000 units. You're striving to become the person that needs to get to 1,000 units. So that's what the exciting journey is in life. It's not about hitting the goal. It's not about the result. It's about becoming the person that you you need to be to get to that goal. Does that make sense, Josh? Boom. That was huge. Marshall, how can the listeners get a hold of you? Yeah, email email me anytime. My email is marshall at tigernational.com. That's marshall at tiger, less the animal, national.com. And if everybody out there is serious about getting to multifamily and you're on the fence, Marshall just gave you his email. He's telling you to reach out to him. If you have any questions, any comments, if you want any kind of underwriting advice, if you want to work with Marshall, if you have any questions, you need to reach out to him. He can't reach out to you. You need to take the next step to get towards your goals. You need to become that person. And I don't want to hear that I'm an ambivert, I'm an introvert. You need to step up. If you want it that badly, take the next step, email our Marshall. Listen, I want to thank Marshall for being an amazing guest on the show and sharing his Movers and Shakers story. Now, if you want to be the next Movers and Shakers guest, email me, josh at jakeandgino.com. And if you like the show, please leave us a review. And until next time, let's make it a Movers and Shakers week. See you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Marshall. Thank you, guys. Hey, Gino, the two most common questions I've been asked are, how do I get into real estate and do my first deal? The other question, how do I scale my real estate portfolio? 
Well, gang, we have great news for you. Gino, tell them about it. We can help you answer both of those questions. At jakeandgino.com, we offer a variety of micro courses to help you along your real estate journey. Our proprietary three-step framework has helped hundreds of real estate entrepreneurs successfully get started in real estate with no experience, and it has also helped experienced real estate entrepreneurs take it to the next level. If you want more information, visit www.jakeandgino.com forward slash courses. That's J-A-K-E-A-N-D-G-I-N-O dot com forward slash courses and use coupon code podcast for 20% off your purchase on taking the next step in your multifamily journey.